Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening to everyone who's here with me on Zoom. Good evening to those who are here with me on Facebook Live. And most importantly, good evening to those of you who are here with me on Torah Anytime. Anybody who wants to hear some quality Torah content, head over to Torah Anytime because they have a tremendous amount of speakers, tremendous amount of shiurim. It's a great place to go looking for great Torah content, TorahAnytime.com. Okay, so tonight we have Pasha's Tazria. And there are a few ideas that I want to share with you about Pasha's Tazria. And then I also want to share some ideas about the Haggadah. And I have a chasna tonight. So we started slightly earlier because of the earlier times now. It's changed around slightly. But in a couple of weeks' time, we'll be back to the normal time of quarter past eight or 20 past eight. Okay, right. So we're going to speak today about Saras. And the two ideas that I want to mention to you about Saras. The first idea about Saras is an idea that I saw today in Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky's Sefer. And Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky points out the following idea, following point. He says, when it comes to tsaras, it's really policing yourself. You don't have to police. Nobody else can police you. And he says, more importantly, it's not really a physical malady as such. Because if it was a physical malady, then it wouldn't make a difference whether you had or whether you hadn't checked up with the Kohen, the same thing would happen. You know, I think a lot of people can think about this now when it comes to, for example, when we speak about Corona, okay? If you have a Corona test, whether you have or whether you haven't had a test for Corona, if you have the symptoms, you might still make somebody else sick. And if you, for whatever reason, have contracted corona, even if you are asymptomatic, that means you're not showing any symptoms whatsoever, you don't have a cough, you don't have a headache, you don't have a, a, a cold, whatever else the symptoms are today of corona, even without any of those symptoms, if you have it, you can pass it on. And therefore, there are many people out there that nowadays are taking frequent lateral flow tests whether they need to or they don't need to, because they're worried maybe they're going to get somebody else ill. I think they said now at the moment that one in five adults is walking around with corona and is asymptomatic. I don't know if that statistic is true. But even if it's one in 10, that means one in every 10 people that you meet is walking around with corona and he doesn't know about it and you don't know about it. And anybody in that person's vicinity could potentially contract corona as well. So if we're worried that people are going to get corona, then... There is no difference about whether the coin has said that it's Tomei, the coin hasn't said it's Tomei, whether it has a certain type or whether it doesn't have a certain type of symptom. Either which way, the problem should be a problem regardless. And we know that there are times where the Gemara tells us that we do not go to the coin. Let's say, for example, you have a person who is the middle of Shavar Brochus week. And middle of his Shavar Brochus week, he finds out that actually, wait a second, he has a piece of Tsaras. He does not need to go to the coin and have it checked out. You wait till the end of the Shavar Brochus week and only then do you check it out. But why do you wait till the end of the Shavar Brochus week? Imagine if I said the same thing. You know what? I have a simcha going on. My son's making my mitzvah or I have a wedding happening. And I know I got corona symptoms, but I got a wedding coming up. So I can't cancel the wedding due to corona symptoms. We'll have the wedding first. And after the wedding, a week after the wedding, when the Shavar Brochus are all finished, I'm going to take a lateral flow or PCR test. I'm going to check myself for Corona to see whether I have Corona or not. Would you look at me and say, oh, that's a very responsible thing to do. That makes sense, Rabbi. You got a Simcha coming up. So, I mean, you have to have your Simcha keep on going. You can't cancel your Simcha. So I guess you just get everybody else in your vicinity sick. But that means at least you didn't cancel your Simcha. So that's not a very nice way of going about things. I wouldn't have thought that's a very helpful way of doing things. If you know you have Corona, please be responsible and stay home because other people are going to get it off you. So if Tsaras had the same rules as a regular virus, if it was a physical malady that was actually contagious, there would be no reason and there would be no sense in saying that whether the Kohen does or doesn't say certain things or whether he finds or finds certain things, you got to be very, very careful over there. And yet we see that, let's say, for example, a person has a tsaras. And in the tsaras, there is a hair. And that hair, if it was seen, it's a white hair in a certain tsaras, and that shows that he's tome. And the person went, and he pulls out that white hair. What's that locha now? If the coin would look at that tsaras, and the coin would see it, he would find, hey, it's not tome. There's no white hair in the middle. Then you're okay. 
So how can that be? How could you have such a thing? How could you have a situation where you have a physical malady, where you have something which is a disease that can be passed on from person to person, and the Torah is allowing people to somehow dodge the system and make sure they go undetected? How could you allow people to go undetected in that case? We wouldn't allow people to go undetected with corona. I mean, now we are because we've moved on. We're two years on from it. But originally, we never would have allowed such a thing. So how do we explain this? So what Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky therefore says is, is you have over here not a physical illness. And therefore, because it's not a physical illness, it is not contagious. And if it's not contagious well, then it doesn't really matter if you do or whether you don't get caught with it. If it's not contagious, not contagious, right? Like, I remember there are instances where people have chicken pox, but after a while, I think if all this, all the different scabs that you have uh, have sort of like crusted over, then at that point, you're not contagious anymore. When it comes out, it's already sort of the end of the chicken pox, and then you get all the different things, the scabs that start to build upon the little the little um, uh, blotches that you have on you. And once it's all scabbed over, then you're not contagious. Then you can go out with it. Whether you are, why? Because at that point, there's no point anymore in making somebody stay home. They're not contagious anyway. What difference does it make? Right? So here too, we have, if it was all about being contagious or not being contagious, so then we wouldn't allow the people to go ahead and to try to resolve this on their own or try to make their own decisions about this. However, what we have over here is the following. We have an issue between this man and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, between man and God. And God is sending this individual a message and he's saying to this person, listen, I'm not happy with you. I'm not happy with the way you're functioning. I'm not happy with the way you're behaving. And there is a real problem going on over here. And therefore, I'm sending you this message so you should know there's an issue over here. Right? Now, when you get a message from God, you can do one of two things. You can either decide to heed that message or it is in our power and in our ability to ignore the message as well. If God sends us a message and I decide for myself, you know what? I'm not interested in hearing the message. I'm going to ignore it. Uh, can I do that? Yeah, I can do that. What's going to happen? A woman or another is going to have repercussions. It might not even have repercussions in this world. I might have to wait till I get to the next world to have repercussions. But at one point or another, there will be repercussions for the fact that I didn't heed God's warning. And so God's saying, listen, I want to warn you over here. I want you to know that there's a problem. And therefore, I'm sending you this saras. I'm sending you this malady so that you should know there's an issue. Can you ignore it? Sure. Is it worth your while to ignore it? No, you don't have to. You know, I have somebody that called me up today that spoke to me and he said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling in my marriage. Can I come and can I speak to you? Yeah. But I remember discussing it. This fellow came to me when he was still a chosm, when he was newly married. And before he was married, he had chosm lesson with me. And I sat with him and we discussed certain things. And I, I said certain things to him. I said, look, your wife will expect X, Y, and Z. And he made all sorts of faces at me and then sort of like, oh, why is she doing that? Or why is she asking for that? Or why is she so complicated? You know, you can ask the question from today till tomorrow, but you can either ask yourself the question from today till tomorrow, why is she so complicated and decide not to fit in with the way she functions? Or you can say, I don't really have to understand why women function the way they do. Hashem made them different, and so therefore they function the way they do. And the fact that you don't understand them is actually irrelevant. I don't care why my wife behaves the way she does, because that is her being a woman. And I don't care why other women behave the way they do, because that's just to be defined by this person is a woman. And therefore, this is, even though for men this might be considered aberrant behavior, different behavior, it is for women quite normal behavior. She said, well, why doesn't she behave like a man? Because God didn't make her a man. He made her a man. She behaved like a man. But she isn't. She's a woman. She says, oh, why is she being so? So you can either decide, look, I'll, I'll try to deal with the issues at hand. I'll try to deal with the problems. And whatever it is, you know, if she needs A, then I'm going to give her A, whether I understand or whether I don't understand it. Or I can decide, you know what? She's being difficult. I don't have to give her A. I'm not in the mood, so I don't have to give it to her. Fine. You can decide to do that. And maybe for a short term, you can get away with that. But on the long term, what's going to end up happening is it's going to start to create friction. And if you're not going to play along, if you're not going to play the game, for example, with your wife, so to speak, I don't mean playing the game, but, you know, in, in metaphorically speaking, if you're not going to go along 
with what her needs are and what her wants are and what her expectations are, at one point or another, you're going to be very disappointed. She'll say, but why do I have to play along with her? Okay, fine. You don't have to play along with her. You're right. Why do I have to bow and bend to her will? Let her do what I want. Okay, you can try it. It's, 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 <laughs> lots of men have tried that. I don't know how many men have been successful, but lots of guys have tried it. But the point over here is, there's no point in sort of fighting the system. You can decide to ignore the system. You can say, you know what? This is how I do it. This is what I do. And I don't really care. Oh, climbs here. This is how I do things. I don't really care. And if my wife doesn't like it, she doesn't like it. Then tough luck. Okay. Maybe it will be tough luck. But it could be the other way around also. Instead of being tough luck for her, it could be tough luck for you and for your marriage. And so therefore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you know what? Do you want to ignore my symbol or my sign that says to you, you have to ask? You want to ignore it and continue living your life just the way you want to and just ignoring the fact that I'm telling you, I'm sending you a message and going, hey, something's badly wrong over here. You can decide to ignore it. I'm not going to stop you ignoring it. I don't recommend it. I think you better heed my advice. And when I send you the message, you better react to that message. But God says, I leave it open to you. So you have a tsaras. You want to pull out some of the signs or the symbolism that make your tome and you want to make believe your tar and then show it to the coin. And the coin says your tar. Or you want to just ignore it entirely and not show it to the coin. You can do that. You can decide to ignore it. And God says, that's fine. But if you decide to ignore it, don't come back later and say, why did things go so badly wrong? If you decide to ignore your wife's advice or you decide to ignore your wife's feelings, don't come back afterwards to me and say, I don't know why she's making you now. Now everything goes wrong. Now the whole house is sort of like upside down. Yeah, you know why the house is upside down? Because your wife was giving signs and symbolisms the entire time saying to you, listen, you got to shape up. And you decided to ignore all of those signs. And then you got to live with, with the fallout. Can you ignore them? Sure you can. In life, we can decide to ignore anything. There are people that ignore all sorts of things. There are people that are starting to get into tremendous financial difficulties. And they're starting to see that they're losing money every single week or every single month. And that their business is losing thousands of pounds every month. But they decide to do what the ostriches do. And you stick your head into the sand. But all that happens is when you ignore it is the problem grows and grows and grows. And one day somebody's going to knock on the door and their name is going to be the bailiff or the name is going to be the HMRC or whatever they're going to call. And they're going to say to you, excuse me, you now owe 100,000 pounds. And you're like, I don't know how this happened. Yeah, you do. You know what happened? You ignore the first sign and you ignore the second sign and you ignore the third sign. So one way or another, the problem is going to become exacerbated. The problem is going to get worse. And there, Vakodesh Baruch Hu says, I leave it in your hands. I'm sending you a sign now. I'm telling you, this is the problem. You want to fix the problem? Fix it. You don't want to fix the problem? You want to pull out the hairs and make believe you don't have to ask? You don't want to show it to the coin and just walk around as if nothing happened? Fine. I don't think it's a good idea. But you want to do that? You can do that. And in life, we have been given the choice to take the bull by the horns and to run with it or to ignore things. But in general, if you ignore things, they don't go away. Whatever you ignore often comes back much worse. You know, you're driving and your car is making a noise. And you go, ah, it's nothing. And you're driving and your car still keeps making that noise. And your wife say, what's the noise? And you say, oh, it's nothing. And then you finally get to the mechanic and the mechanic says to you, it's going to cost a thousand pounds to fix. A thousand pounds. Why is it going to cost so much money to fix? Well, it started off okay, but you kept on driving. Had you not kept on driving, it would have cost 50 pounds to fix. But you know what happened? You ruined the item inside there by driving for another 200 miles instead of coming to me right away. So yeah, ignore, ignore the sound the engine's making. But that's at your own risk. And the Torah is telling you the same thing over here. You can ignore Kodesh Baruch Hu's symbolisms, but it's at your own risk and you decide whether that is a clever idea or not. But in general, Coach Baruch was saying, I don't think it's a good idea. I wouldn't recommend it. Okay? Point number one. Now, point number two, the Chassam Sofas is a beautiful idea that I saw tonight. And we have a very strange halacha. The halacha is as follows. If you have a person that has tsaras, and the tsaras covers the person from head to toe, in that instance, a person is going to be considered tahar. Whereas... Okay, 
This is verse Perk Yud Gimel, Pasuk Yud Gimel. The Ra'a Kohen, page 612 in the art scrolls. The Kohen sees, V'hine kisa tzaras is called basar. Behold, the tzaras, this leprosy, has covered his entire flesh, his entire body. V'tia es anoga, and he's able to say it's to her. Kulo afach lov on her. It's entirely white, and therefore it's entirely to her. Says the Chassam Sofer, that you will find instances where you have people that are dangerous and are visibly dangerous, and you will find instances where people are dangerous but are not as visibly dangerous. So let's say you're walking through Moss Side and you see a gang, whatever the gang is, whether the gang is of youths or adults, whether they're white, whether they're black, whether they're Hispanic, whether they're, you know, they, they can be of any type. But, you know, I'm not, we're not going to start, start saying anything racist over here. We're not talking about any specific type of person. You walk past the gang and you find that this gang is looking really dangerous and they're playing around with drugs and you can see some of them have hidden guns or hidden knives. What do you do at that point? You run. You just get out of there. Move away. Just keep moving. Don't look. It looks like somebody's getting beaten up or it looks like somebody's in trouble. You don't want to get involved with these people. Sometimes people get involved. All that means is now instead of one person getting beaten up, two people get beaten to a pulp. It doesn't help you to get involved over there. Look away, keep walking, put your head down and leave them alone. My wife often gets worried when we're working down the street and sometimes you see some people that look very, very rough. And she says, don't even look at them. Don't even. I'm like, no, these guys aren't rough. They're just, you know, they're doing their own thing. Leave them alone. But sometimes you see some rough guys and even I, I my heart gets a beat. And I'm like, these guys look very rough. Okay, I just want to get out of here. I'm going to turn around. I'm going to cross the road. You go somewhere else. So when you have all these rough guys, it's very easy to know who the rough guys are. And it's very easy to keep away from them. Just make sure you keep out of their way. And if they ask you a question, either don't answer it or answer it and get out of there. Or, you know, give them what they want and move on. Happens with many people. Hey, you got 20 quid? Yeah, here you go. Goodbye. Don't ask the question, what do you need it for? Why are you asking me for money? <laughs> Forget about all of that. You want 20 pounds? I am so happy that I'm able to be the one that gives you the 20 pounds. Enjoy it, cult of, and go away. That's it. Right away. And I know a lot of people, I remember a friend of mine said he once was at a, uh, at a train station. He missed, he was supposed to come back with us and he missed our train and he got on the next train and he got off the train station and at the train station, he's standing there alone. And this homeless guy shows up. I am who looks slightly dangerous. He says, Hey man, you have any money? The guy pulled out $20, gave it to him and said, enjoy it and ran off. Right. I wasn't going to fight with a homeless guy. I'm scared. I'm afraid. I don't think that's good for me. Right. Whereas I'll tell you have other people like con men who are much, much more nefarious. Why? It's much more dangerous with these guys. Nobody knows where they stand. The guy could be a con man, and he's trying to con you out of hundreds, thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of pounds, but he looks very respectable. He could look anything like I do, you know, a tie, a shirt, a suit, to show up in a hat even, you know, some people are even from work con men. And they come to you and they sell you the world and they tell you about this product that they have and they sell you a Ponzi scheme or whatever it might be or that, you know, and they, they talk the talk. And really you're taken by them because a lot of these con men are very, very good at what they do. Otherwise they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't be able to be con men if they weren't good at what they did. Or they play a numbers game. So I send an email to a thousand people or 10,000 people. If one out of 10,000 people sends me money, bingo, I made money. Right? There might be easier ways of making money rather than calling people out of it. But this is what the person has decided to do. When you're dealing with a con man, how easy is it to spot them? Very hard. Some con men sort of like, you know, they uh, exude an air of, I can't be trusted. But many con men don't exude that air. And that's part of the, what makes them so successful at being con men is that nobody knows whether these guys are trustworthy or not. And they come across very trustworthy. And so they come to you with an investment and you invest with them and suddenly your money disappears. And you have become the next victim of a very cleverly put together scheme. Now, who is harder to keep away from? Is it harder to keep away from the murderer or is it harder to keep away from the con man? It's much harder to keep away from the con man. The murderer, he's obvious. The gang member, you cross the road. I know right away when I see certain guys in Vienna that are skinheads that are walking down the street, I just, I don't want to be on the same side of the street as them. 
You just cross over the road right away. I'm not going to start up with these guys. I'm not going to say hello to them. I'm not going to go past them. These guys are dangerous. You know they're dangerous. Forget it. You know who's much more dangerous? The guys where you don't know that they're dangerous. The guys where you cannot tell that these guys really pose a danger. Those chavra are much, much worse. Because you never know what to do with them. You don't know how to save yourself from them. And that's why so many people get taken in by them. Says the Torah, according to Sam Sofer, where you have a guy that is a little bit like this and a little bit like that. So on the one hand, he comes to you and he seems to be a really nice friend. And he says, Michael, you're such a great guy. And Clive, I've always liked you. And Mochi, you're fantastic, et cetera, et cetera. And then behind your back, as soon as Clive comes off the Zoom session, I'm going to look at Malcolm Bernard. I'm going to say, Malcolm, do you want to know what I heard about Clive? Do you know what a nice guy Clive is, et cetera, et cetera? So to his face, I make believe I'm the nicest guy around. As soon as he's off, I'm going to rank him out. So it's very hard for Clive to know to be careful in my vicinity. Because anytime Clive's, oh, oh, Clive's coming back on the Zoom. He's coming back on the Zoom. He comes on. Clive, so nice to see you. Back to the fake smile. Now, you know, he goes back off the Zoom. Oh, I hate that Clive guy, right? Can you imagine? Yeah, he wouldn't know what, he, he wouldn't know how to, to guard himself from me. Because what I'm doing is, is I'm being very toothpaste, two-faced. On the one, I'm being nice to him to his face. But on the other hand, as soon as I don't see him, I stab him in the back. <coughs> and the guy with the tsaras is the fellow, that two-faced individual. He's got skin that looks pretty good. But on one spot, he's got a little blotch. And that blotch says, this isn't really very good. This guy's got problems also. He's not as nice as he seems. He's not as clean. You, know, you look at my face, you say, oh, he's, he's got good skin, right? I know people, for example, unfortunately, they have eczema. But the eczema is sort of like, you know, on their elbows, by their knees. So if they're fully dressed and you look at their skin and say, oh, this person looks like they have good skin. Until they walk in one day with a short sleeve T-shirt and you're like, oh, my goodness, what happened to their arm? Right? Because the arm is full of eczema. The face isn't sometimes. So you don't know what the person is. The tzaras symbolizes the two-faced person who on the one side is really, really nice to somebody. On the other hand, is really horrible to that person. So you have a bit of nice skin and a bit of tzaras skin. And there the Torah says, that guy needs to be thrown out of the machana. You got to kick him out. You got to expose this person because the person needs to be, people need to see that this is actually a terrible individual. This is an individual that treats people badly, et cetera, et cetera. And that's not to be compared to the person that has saras from the top of his head to his toes. Because that's the guy that everybody can tell this guy is through and through bad. This guy is so bad that everybody knows it. This is the gang leader. This is the neo-Nazi skinhead, whatever it is. And everybody knows this guy's problematic. And so because everybody knows this guy's problematic and everybody can see from a mile that he's a problem, you keep away from him. And therefore, the Torah tells us, if you have a guy that has saras from top to bottom, there's no need to keep away from this guy. There's no need to turn him into this pariah and call him Tommy. Because everybody else sees that he's a pariah anyway. The one who needs to be exposed is the guy who's got a little stain over here under his T-shirt. And nobody knows about it. And the coin finds out, he says, you got to go out of the machna. You got to expose yourself. You got to tell everybody else. I'm Tome, I have Taras. I'm not really as good as I seem. Let people know, let people be careful. So that's the difference. That's why the fellow who's got Taras of his entire body is able to stay Tahar because everybody knows where we stand with him. Whereas a person who has a very small blemish, we don't know where we stand with that guy. And that's why the Torah says over there in that instance that the person needs to go out of the machni, needs to go out of the encampment, and he is Tommy. Okay? So those are the two ideas that I wanted to share with you today. I'm Pasha's Tazria. And now we move over to some ideas on the Haggadah. Okay? So tonight I'd like to speak a little bit about the Hisha this is what stood for our fathers and for us. It's not only one. Excuse me. It's not only one person on his own that stood up against us to destroy us. In all generations, they try to destroy us. And Hashem saves us from their hands. That is what we say. This is the prayer of. This is the poem. 
almost, of a hishamda. So we say that, what is this vehi? And this stood for us. So tonight I saw two different explanations. Let's see how much time we have, how long it takes to go through the two explanations. Still need to get to Rabbi Walker's wedding tonight. So I'm going to, we're going to try and see how much we get through this. Explanation number one. Vehi sha'omda la v'xeyna v'lonu. You know what stood for our forefathers from us? Yitzias Mitzrayim. Coming out of Egypt. Coming out of Egypt was a once in a lifetime experience. And it remained ingrained in the psyche of our people for thousands of years. For thousands of years, every Seder night, people used to get together, used to ring the Paschal Lamb, and they used to sit and used to tell, tell over the story of the Exodus of Egypt. And they used to tell over the story, the miraculous story of the Makkas, of the different types of plagues that there were. Everything that went with it. Unbelievable stuff. All that is part of our national conscience. All that is part of something that our nation holds on to. And therefore, at any point in time when people tried to get rid of us, at any point in time where people said, we need to get rid of these people, these Jews, Jews always look back to the Seder night. Jews always look back to what happened and in Egypt, and as well at the fact that we, no matter what happens, we sit together at the Seder together with our grandparents and together with our grandchildren. Amen, Hashem. And we pass on that story from father to son, from mother to daughter. It goes on and on and on. And this story of Ehi Sha'amda, the story of this tremendous exodus that we live through, that's the story that we remember, that we say, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you took us out of Egypt. And the fact that you took us out of Egypt, not just in some kind of like normal fashion. Oh, there was emancipation and they decided to let free, let them go. They were, they were miracles. There were 10 plagues. There was a smiting of the firstborn. There was the splitting of the Sea of Reeds. There's the fact that the Jewish people make it through the sea. And instead... The Egyptians drowned in the sea and the Jewish people sing Shira. All of that, we remember every Seder night and we say every Seder night, that story is something that we look towards and that story that is something that inspires us. And it has kept generations of Jews Jewish. Because there's so many people over the years, over the centuries that have tried to get rid of us. And yet... Who saved us then, and the remembrance of the fact that Kodesh Baruch Hu saved us then remained with us forever and keeps us as a nation forever. So that's the first translation of and one more translation in that idea, and then we're going to finish. And that's the following you know what stood for our forefathers and for us. We go back in the in this. Haggadah, and we see, say, Omad, what happens? Akosh Baruch Hu, Chishev Esaketz. Kodesh Baruch Hu calculated the time when the Jewish people need to get out. When did the Jewish people have to get out of Egypt? They had to really get out of Egypt according to what Akosh Baruch Hu told Avram Avinu. He set them after 400 years. What happened in the end? 210 years. How did that happen? How could you get out after 210 years when God said 400 years? It's not right. So we have calculations how we got on with the, with the numbers. But beyond the calculations of how we got on with the numbers, there's another point to be made over here. And that is, not only do the numbers have to fit, but you also say, wait a minute. So the Jewish people got out of Egypt early. Why did that happen? It happened because we were worried if the Jewish people stayed for too long in the land of Egypt. They would assimilate into their culture entirely. They would become, they would descend into 50th level of impurity, the Nun Shari Tuma, and they'd never be able to get out of Egypt again. So God says, I need my nation to be able to get out of Egypt at one point or another. And the way to do it is by taking them out early. And so HaKadosh Baruch Hu Chishev he figured out how long we as a nation could actually take it and kept us in Egypt only that long. And the truth is, if you look back at history, you will find in each instance where there was terrible atrocities, where there were terrible atrocities that were perpetrated against the Jewish people, 
they're always at one point or another, God was mechashim the kates. Never did God say, oh, let them keep going, let them keep going, let them keep going. Even in the Holocaust, we say six million Jews. How could six million Jews die? So the answer to that question is a whole different year. But the question also could be, well, how come 12 million didn't die? That was only a third of world Jewry, only in inverted commas, obviously. It's not a small amount of people, but so many others survived. And God said at one point or another, we need to pull the plug on this. Can't have this go on forever. Can't have Judaism eradicated entirely. So yes, whilst there are so many people that died, God says, we got to pull the plug. And we got to pull the plug on Chmelnitsky and his terrible hordes. And we got to pull the plug on the pogroms of the Crusades. And you got to pull the plug on the people that destroyed the base of English and were killing people indiscriminately left, right, and center. At one point or another, Kodesh Baruch who says, yes, you're right. It may be so that these people deserve the punishment and they got the punishment that they deserve. But now that they receive the punishment that they deserve or whatever it was, for whatever reason that God chose for people to suffer so terribly, I cannot let the Jewish people be wiped out. There has to be a point where I draw a line in the sand and I say, up to here and no further. And that's that case, the fact that God always draws the line, that fact that at one point or another, God says, no, no more. It has to stop. That has helped us because so many people have stood up and so many people have tried to kill us. Behold, of in each generation, and who says, in every generation, Maybe some of them will die, but not all of them. I will never allow my Jewish people to be killed out entirely. And that's part of what we pass on to our children at the Seder. And we say to them the two ideas that I mentioned to you. Number one, the centrality of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, of the Exodus of Egypt, to our religion and to our way of thinking. Number one. Number two, the fact that God always saves us. Sometimes it takes longer, sometimes it takes shorter. But there's always a case. There's always going to be an end. And when that end comes, God says, that's it. No more. And then everything turns around. So those are the ideas I wanted to share with you tonight. I want to thank all of you again for joining me. I'm sorry about the earlier time so that, you know, not everybody was here from the beginning. But thank you so much for those who joined me on Facebook Live, for those who joined me on Zoom, and for all of you on Twitter anytime. Thank you so much for joining me as well. If you want to Get in touch. It's David Eisenberg at gmail.com. And I look forward to hearing from you. And I look forward to seeing you, Mitzvah Shem, and for you listening to these share next week. Yeah. Yeah.